All right, let's go Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text up on the screens behind me in just a little bit. We also have some physical Bibles scattered around the room, little racks beneath the seats. If you don't own a Bible, don't have one that you get to call yours, we would invite you to take that physical one home. Uh, we believe that God's Word is important for all sorts of amazing things, but the, the best of all the amazing things is that God uses His Scriptures, uh, the Bible, to make himself known to his people, and we want you to know him. Uh, we think that that's uh, a good thing. Um, so we're, we're in our third week now, our third week of an effort to walk through the book of Matthew together. And uh, if, if you haven't been around, what, what, what's the, the general idea of Matthew? Well, Matthew is a gospel account. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that Matthew sets out to tell us about the life and work of Jesus. So his birth, his public ministry, his uh, death on the cross, and then ultimately, finally, his resurrection and ascension, right? And if you're here this morning, and maybe you just happen to be completely brand new to the Bible, I don't know, maybe you, your friend dragged you here, and that's the only reason you came, whatever. Um, but here's what you need to know, all right? There are four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? You can rattle them off, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they all tell the same story to different audiences with different points of emphasis, all right? That's the goal, all right? Uh, so uh, what, what do I mean by points of emphasis, though? I mean that they all look at the singular experience of following Jesus around, listening to him teach, watching him do miracles, uh, healing people, all all the things that he does, right, they all look at the singular experience of following Jesus and intentionally highlight different things about who he is and what he did so that the specific people in their audience, the specific people that they are writing to, can understand and believe and then follow Jesus just like they do. Right? That's the goal of the gospel accounts. Mark appears we're pretty confident that Mark appears to be written to a Roman audience, all right? Uh, John seems to be written to the Greeks. Luke is written to a Roman official named Theophilus, though uh, it seems like he's aiming at an audience beyond Theophilus as well. That's kind of a mixture of Jews and Gentiles, all right? But Matthew, however, Matthew, however, uh, wrote his gospel to a very, very, it seems very Jewish audience, Right? And because of that, the way that Matthew frames his account is to showcase Jesus as the prophesied Messiah and King who fulfills all of the promises that God ever made to his covenant people. All right? That's Matthew's game plan. The Jews would look at anybody who was making messianic claims and immediately demand that, that, that evidence to prove that that person was actually checking off all of the boxes that were supposed to be checked off for the Messiah. And so that's exactly what Matthew gives them. All right? As the promised son of David, Matthew shows that Jesus is establishing and ascending to an eternal throne. As the promised son of Abraham, Jesus is bringing blessing to the entire world. All right? So, okay, but how does Matthew actually pull that off? That, I mean, this sounds like a big deal. How does he actually put Jesus on display in that manner? Well, there are two specific tasks to which Matthew seems to commit himself in his writing. All right? For starters, Matthew seems, uh, or not seems, he's going to spend a, a significant amount of time, more time than any of the other three gospel writers by a long way, pointing to how Jesus fulfills not only a bunch of direct Jewish prophecy, that's certainly there, but he also points to dozens and dozens of things about Jesus' life and work that he claims were all foreshadowed by the story of the Jews. There's a consistent refrain all throughout the book of Matthew. You're going to hear it over and over again. We're going to hear it three times next Sunday, all right? This was to fulfill what was said over and over and over again. Matthew, Matthew bangs that drum ad nauseum, right? Uh, major parts of Israel's history, the exodus, the exile, minor parts of, this, of their history, uh, like commands for the appearance of the temple. Matthew's angle is not merely to say that Jesus fulfills a couple of you know, vague prophecies that nobody really paid attention to before now. No, Matthew sees, sees Jesus as the greater and final version of every bit of Israel's story. That Jesus steps onto the scene specifically to be the greater and more perfect Israel. The second way that Matthew puts Jesus on display is to, well, is to simply let the king speak. He organizes his account in around five major teachings from Jesus. We call them discourses, right? And each discourse frames something about Jesus' good kingdom, the ethics, the logic, and priorities of the kingdom, etc., 
The most famous of those discourses, the one that everybody's familiar with, even a bunch of non-Christians are familiar with, is the one that's commonly called the Sermon on the Mount. All right? It's one of the five discourses. And so Matthew, Matthew intentionally bounces back and forth between chunks of teaching and then chunks of biography uh, where Jesus is affirming his authority through signs and wonders, all right? otherwise known as miracles. But before we get to the discourses, the discourses of the king, Matthew first introduces the king. So the last couple of weeks, we've looked at what is essentially Jesus' origin story, right? And Matthew starts by giving a selective genealogy. It doesn't include every single name that could be included, but Matthew seems to have have two purposes for including the names that he chooses to include. Uh, One is to show that there are a whole bunch of really embarrassing people in Jesus' family tree. I don't, know if you, I don't know if you caught that when we read through it, or maybe you've read through it on your own. If you're trying to, to craft and kind of manipulate an origin story, if you're trying to hype up your guy, you try to downplay a lot of the folks that Matthew intentionally highlights. But Jesus is a sinless Savior that comes from and for an incredibly sinful people. The second reason for Matthew's selective genealogy is to verify that Jesus really does descend from Davidic and Abrahamic stock. In other words, Jesus has all, and I mean all, of the rightful claims to the throne. Last week, after the genealogy, we saw the announcement of Jesus' coming told from the perspective of his adoptive father, Joseph, right? The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. It's a nice-sounding prophecy, but it's a really hard story to believe when you're the guy watching it play out. It's a hard story to swallow when you encounter it for the first time, and it's your fiancé, betrothed, soon-to-be, whatever, wife that is telling you that story. And so what we learned last week is that right out of the gate, Joseph doesn't want to hear it. He thinks that Mary, his betrothed, has been unfaithful to him, and so he's ready to walk away. But God sends another messenger to him and confirms that what's going on, no, no, it is indeed from the Holy Spirit. God really is in this. You can believe her. God really did do what Mary is saying that God has done. And so Joseph is given his own charge to humbly be obedient to God, to to care for them and to to provide for them. And, And what we saw last week is that Joseph absolutely was that guy. He was absolutely that guy. He took care of Mary and Jesus, even though legally speaking and morally speaking, it wasn't actually his responsibility. That's not on him. Hey, you want a quick read test uh, for judging the godliness of a man's character? And it's far from the only thing that you need to be looking at for sure, but it's a really simple test. Watch how he owns responsibility even for things that aren't demanded of him. If you want to know who that guy is, that'll tell you who that guy is. The way he picks up the task in front of him, even when it's technically outside of the job description, yeah, you'll find out real quick who you're looking at. And even with the small amount of, that we know about Joseph from the biblical record, and it's, it's noticeably small. But even with the small amount that we have, what we do learn is that Joseph is a man full of gentle and humble character. Incredibly gentle and humble character. And so last week we ended with verses 24 and 25. It's, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So you ready to dig into chapter 2? Let's go. Matthew chapter 2, starting in verse 1. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Let's call a time out there. So, hey guys, we have another Christmas text. Well, sort of. Sort of. It's not really a Christmas text, even though it often gets treated as a Christmas text, but we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, there are several things to break down here in these first couple of verses that we got to talk about before we get to that part, but those of you who know it's coming, it'll be fun. All right, so notice, notice that Matthew just skips right over the actual birthday part of Jesus's birth narrative. It just flies right past it. Luke goes into great detail, but Matthew, he just barely even acknowledges it. Um, and so there's, uh, there's no account of the census. There's, there's no mention of angelic worship exploding on the hillside. Don't we love that part of the story? Uh, and, and like I mentioned last week, there's no shepherds. Not a single one of them. You can't put on a children's play without the shepherds. 
But Matthew just goes, after Jesus was born. And so if you're looking for new details to pick up and pick apart, and Matthew is often going to leave you frustrated. Um, but that does not mean that Matthew fails to offer us new information here. It's from Matthew that we learn that Herod is still alive when Jesus is born. Luke briefly mentions Herod. He, he, it's in, it is in, Herod's account, or in Luke's account. Luke briefly mentions Herod um, when he's pronouncing the coming birth to Zech- of John to Zechariah. And so it's earlier in the story. Uh, and so there's just enough time in there for some political changes to happen. So you're not really sure. Uh, but knowing that Herod is still alive post Jesus' birth helps us with the timeline. Because we know when Herod died. It was 4 B.C. And so that puts Jesus' birth somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. And I know that saying that date like that is going to confuse some people because a lot of y'all probably just always assume that the whole B.C. A.D. thing meant that Jesus was clearly born in the year 1. But the Anno Domini system has always been a mess. Like, it's, like there have been people critiquing it for as long as it's been around. We've known for it over a thousand years now that it was off by just a little bit. So our most educated estimate is that Jesus was born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C. So Herod being in this story, or at least this part of the story, it matters. Like, like calendars shift because of this. It matters a lot. But who is Herod? Well, that's actually pretty complicated. Right, Herod is a foreign-born client king of the Roman Empire. Right? And so even though Israel and Judah used to be their own kingdoms and have their own kings, that's not true anymore. And it hasn't been true for hundreds of years. Um, at this point in history, Judea is an administrative region of someone else's empire, a faraway region of that empire. And so how do you effectively rule a faraway region of your growing empire? Well, you set up client kings, otherwise known as puppet kings. You give them some money, you give them some property, and just a tiny bit of power, and you threaten to take every ounce of it away if they don't do what you expect them to do. That's how that works. Say hello to Herod I, better known by his nickname, Herod the Great. Though, according to the Roman Senate, he was known as the King of the Jews. Which is ironic, because Herod wasn't a Jew at all. He was an Idumean, an Edomite. He was from a region just south of Judea. And at the time of Jesus' birth, he had been the king for a little over 30 years. Herod made a name for himself by a couple of different means. First of all, Herod's family was personally super wealthy. Uh, he, He also had quite the eye for architecture. And so there is a very, and I mean very long list of temples and buildings and statues all throughout the entirety of the Roman Empire that has Herod listed as the main or only patron for. He built all kinds of stuff. The two biggest of the projects on the list were one, the entire city of Caesarea Maritima. Like the entire city. You can go uh, Google the Battle of Actium later, uh, learn how Octavian won the battle and then gave the destroyed city to Herod and Herod rebuilt it, all right? And then named it after him. But the project that we need to pay attention to is that, because it matters most for our story and for our situation, is that Herod initiated a massive expansion of the Jewish temple. If you're not familiar with the post-exile part of the Old Testament history, Israel comes back from Babylon, comes out of exile, and, the guy, and a guy named Zerubbabel leads uh, them to uh, rebuild the temple that had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, right? And so uh, the new temple, though, is, is smaller than what Solomon built, and it's significantly less ornate. Right? There's a lot of reasons to, to start going, well, this isn't as good as it used to be. And they deal with that for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so uh, in 19 BC, right, Herod's like, I can endear myself to these people. And so he kicked off a project that lasts for over 70 years to expand the temple. It outlives even Herod. Most of the heaviest construction was all finished uh, in the first 10 years or so. So by the time that, that Jesus was born. Uh, but then they set to decorating all that new construction. Carvings and gold filigree and statues everywhere. And all those kinds of things. And they were still working on it when Jesus is sitting in the temple at the end of Matthew. Saying things like, not a single one of these stones are going to be left on top of each other. And so here the 
very intentional posturing buried in that situation. The masterpiece project uh, from the Roman declared king of the Jews, the actual king of the Jews looked at it and said, yeah, this is all coming down. Never, ever, 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 ever doubt why certain people wanted Jesus dead. The second way, the second way that Herod made a name for himself was his temper and paranoia. Turns out client kings sit on very uneasy thrones. And so Herod is reported to have regularly flown into fits of rage. We know that he killed off one of his wives. We know that he killed off one of his sons. And we think that he might have possibly also killed off a brother. All at different times, mind you, because at different points in time, he suspected each of them of plotting against him and his throne. Lovely guy. And so hypothetical question, just purely theoretical. How do you think Herod felt when magi from a faraway land showed up at his palace one day asking where the new king was. We'll look at verse 3 real quick. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. I don't know how many people are in the room when the magi show up, but you can imagine everybody shooting sideways glances at everybody else wondering what's about to happen. Right? What's this guy about to do? We're about to watch a show of him going off. But who are the Magi, right? Well, despite what the Christmas carol tries to argue, they're not kings. Um, they are from the Orient, though. Uh, that is, if you're using a Latin vocabulary, vocabulary rather than our, our modern Western one, Orient is simply the Latin word of something coming from the East. Magi is a, is a word that's only found a couple of other places in the Bible, like at all. Uh, the only other time it's used in the New Testament is in the book of Acts, where Luke is telling us about a, a wicked magician running around who's trying to, to like mess up some things. And if that's all we had, then our definition of Magi would be pretty limited, but that's not all we have. We also have the Septuagint. Right? The Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. That was already, already floating around in Jesus' day. And so in the book of Daniel, the Septuagint version of the book of Daniel, we see Magi. Daniel, Magi serve as a, as a counselor figure to the king in Babylon and in Persia. There were certainly mystical element to them, but mostly they were just highly studied. It was their job to be wise men in the king's court. That's why we get that wise men title. In the story of Daniel, Daniel is a magus, singular form. Magus, singular, magi, plural. And so the magi of Babylon and Persia, they, they would have respected Daniel. They would have had access to his writings and his, specifically to his prophecy. They, they likely would have been familiar and, and, and at least in some cases maybe even believed the Jewish, other Jewish prophetic works. So we don't know what kind of shift occurred in definitions and in, in roles between Daniel's day and the end of the first century B.C. There's a lot of gray area there. But we do know that God repeatedly saw fit to make his future plans known to several Gentile groups all throughout the Old Testament. That was an intentional act of God. And it appears, at least at the very minimum, that a handful of really, really smart probably pagan people from the east knew Jewish prophecy and believed it enough to follow a new star when it showed up in the sky one day. It's like, hey, we ought to go do something about that. They immediately attached significance to it and meaning to it and, and say, aha, Daniel's foretold king might have actually arrived. Let's go, boys. Let's go see him. But what is, that, what is this supposed star that they're following? What's it made of? How, how does it work? You want the super scholarly answer? I don't know. <laughs> I got no idea, man. There have been a lot of people who have tried to make scientific attempts to, at explaining the phenomenon. It ranges all the way from people arguing that, you know, that, that for hallucinations, and some people argue that, well, maybe it was like ball lightning. And, and of course, the most straightforward reading is just to say that God put a new star in the sky. You want a really, really scholarly opinion on which is the best explanation? I don't care. I really don't. You want to know why? It's because we're dealing with a story about the eternal Son of God putting on flesh and dwelling among us. Whatever God needs to do to put a star in the sky, he's got it. And that's not outside of his character or ability. He can just do what he wants, right? 
So whatever the answer is, it's not hard for him. It's not outside of anything that he's done in the past or will do in the future. And so we've got, we've got wise men from the east following old prophecies and heavenly bodies, whatever they are, to a palace where they'd expect a new king to be born, a new king to be residing. And then we've got a paranoid puppet receiving the news for the very first time. And we've got some onlookers nervous about what's going to happen next. So the obvious question is, what happens next, right? Well, verse 3. Verse 3 it says, When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Verse 4 And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. All right. So Herod seems at least on the surface, seems to regain his composure for a moment. He starts playing it cool, even though everyone probably knows better. But he also immediately goes to work, right? The Idumean king of the Jews knows that there's this Christ figure floating out in the ether somewhere for his people. His subjects are passionate about this, long for this, supposedly are looking for this. But he's not Jewish. He hasn't really cared up until now to know all the details. He doesn't know them. So what does he do? He calls in his religious advisors, a meaning of community stakeholders, if you will. I'm told that it's made up of chief priests and scribes of the people. Which means, church, we are not at all talking about a bunch of random, slightly educated religious folk. The chief priests as a group, and that would be distinct from the chief priests, but... The, the chief priests as a group, they were in charge of worship in the temple. They organized it. You had to go through them to get things approved. All right? The scribes were literally seen as the experts of the law of Moses. And so what we're dealing with here are a group of people who know the law and the prophets inside and out. They know everything you can know about them if you're walking around with normal person brain. And they immediately have an answer for Herod's question. They don't even slow down. Oh, the Christ? Yeah, 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 yeah. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And they point straight to the prophet Micah. And I think it's important to point out, I think it's really, really important to point out that this is tragically the last time we see this group in Matthew's birth narrative. Now, we see these same positions of people later on in Matthew's gospel, scribes and chief priests, 30 some odd years later, Jesus is running around as an adult and we see scribes and priests and those guys are always setting themselves up as the enemy of Jesus and his claims to be the Christ. This is the last time we see this group as it's made up in the birth narrative. And what we need to notice is that this, the posture of, of the scribes and the priests being set against Jesus as an adult doesn't start when Jesus is an adult. When he's making his own Messiah claims. There's a grand company of wise men in the town. Imagine the parade that came through. With all the pomp and circumstances they rolled in. There's a grand company of wise men in town. Herod suddenly calls them in for a meeting and wants to know things about the Christ figure and say, yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look, at, the, look at the prophet Micah. Did, did, he told us that the, the, the Christ was to be born in Bethlehem. It's just down the road from here. And then what do we see? They give an answer. And at least from the text, seemingly they just head back home. There's no excitement from them. They don't appear to be moved in worship in any way. No one goes, oh, thank God it finally came. Today is finally the day. They give a scholarly answer to a scholarly question, and it seems that they go back to their regular business. Church, if anyone in the city of Jerusalem should have been longing for and anticipating the coming Christ, if anyone in the city of Jerusalem should have been exploded with joy at the, even the, 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 the hint of the question, at the news, it should have been this group of people. But we don't see that. It's absent from the story. And that tells me 
That having the right religious answer is a completely different matter than having a rightly related heart. And unfortunately, you can have the former without having the latter. The greatest moment in all of history, in the history of the world, was happening right under their noses. A moment that they were culturally and even professionally positioned to rightly understand. And for whatever reason, they seemed completely unmoved by it. But while the priests and the scribes should have known better, as they should have, they ought to have responded better, I actually go back and forth on which response breaks my heart more because, well, Herod truly is the bad guy of the story. So look what happens next in verse 7. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Verse 8, and he, went and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. So nobody, and I really mean nobody, who knows Herod thinks that he really means this. Nobody. He has zero intent to actually find the Christ child so that he can worship him too. And that's probably why Herod called the Magi away into a secret meeting here. They don't know him yet. He starts trying to figure out Exactly when the star showed up. Notice that he never doubts their sincerity. He never doubts what the priests and the scribes tell him. He seems to actually believe the entire thing. But Herod is Herod. And he's got a plan, and that plan is sinister. Next next week we'll see him act on that plan. He's looking to kill the supposedly newborn king. It's not mentioned here how long the star had been there, just that the Magi had an answer for him. But next week in verse 16, Matthew does tell us the answer. It's two years. They noticed a new star marking the birth of a king two years before that moment. And this is why I'm so up in arms about you know, your, your nativity scene having wise men in it. It's because they weren't there. <laughs> they weren't there. They're still in Babylon when Jesus was born. And so if you want your nativity scene to be historically accurate, what you need to do is place your wise men at your neighbor's house. Right? <laughs> and, then, and then spend two years slowly progressing them there. <laughs> It'd be great. Your neighbors will love it. All right. Verse 9. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Verse 11, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh, And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So they they leave the palace and the star appears again, but this time somehow, some way, it's now more localized than it was before. They were just following a star that had been placed in the sky that, that apparently only the people who were actually looking for it noticed. But then they leave the palace and now the star is guiding them. And again, I have no clue how that works. This is where those ball lightning folks are at their strongest. I'll I'll admit that. But however it works, what we need to learn here from Matthew is that the Magi rejoiced at the sight of it. Why would they rejoice at just seeing the star again? It's because they were now finally on their way to see the king. No more wandering around aimlessly. No more showing up at the palace because I guess that's where kings are supposed to be. They know exactly where they're going. They know exactly who's leading them there. And they're on their way. And what do they do when they walk in the door? We're told that they immediately fell down and worshipped. Think of the difference in the settings here. Right? What kind of stark contrast they saw between the palace and this, this humble home. No servants, no regality. 
probably first century version of whatever Judean poverty looked like. We learn from Luke's account that Mary and Joseph couldn't find any room in the guest house because of the census, right? And so the town was full of people, and therefore there was no room in the inn. Right? We also know that Mary and Joseph laid Jesus in a manger, a feeding trough. And so even though it's not explicit in Luke's text, the theory is that they ended up sleeping where the animals slept. And, and everybody's got a theory about what that, what that actually means, and then there's all kinds of opinions about it. And some have argued that it's a barn, and some have argued, well, no, it probably would have been a hewn-out rock, a cave kind of thing. And, but the more urban the area, the more likely the home would have been set up in such a way uh, as to keep the animals in the lower section, the downstairs section of the house, um, and while the, the upstairs section of the house was reserved for everything else. Right? In many Jewish homes, not all by any, by any means, not all, uh, but in many Jewish homes, the downstairs section would have been a working area, and the upstairs section would have been kind of the living area. All right? And so we don't know how this particular house was set up. We have no idea. We don't know who it would have belonged to, and probably an extended family member of Joseph's. It's our best guess. But however many months later, it seems that Mary and Joseph and Jesus, Jesus have moved to the house proper, whether it's from the, the stable into the house or from the downstairs where the, the animals are into the upstairs where you actually live in the house, right? And when the Magi get there, well, I mean, when they finally get there, and they know exactly what to do. They know exactly what to do. They, they prostrate themselves and they bring out the gifts. And it's from the gifts here that... The Christmas carol makes what I think is another unfounded assumption. Um, we see three specific gifts mentioned, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? Maybe in the Christmas decorations that you just finally took down, unless your names are Rockefeller, all right? Um, maybe in the Christmas decorations that you just finally took down, you got something that represents gold, frankincense, and myrrh, right? But we don't know how many wise men there were. It's at least two because we're using the plural word, magi, instead of magus. So at least two, but it could have just as easily have been 20. We don't know. But regardless of how the Christmas carol treats it, man, preachers for generations now, I've been around my share, preachers for generations have made an even bigger meal um, out of trying to attach symbolism around the gifts, right? Uh, and everybody's got a theory about what these three gifts represent. And um, Honestly, I, I, I genuinely just think that those are the kind of gifts that you give to royalty. They're costly items. You ever been in a situation where you needed to buy a, a birthday present for the kid that's got wealthy parents? That's an awkward situation. You feel, you feel judged a little bit, right? I'm, I can't be the only one. Stop it. All right. And so you feel like you got to up your game, right? The kids, this kid's a prophesied king. There's no, there's no, like, there's no spending limit on this one. You got to throw the best gift at it. I think we make far, far too big a deal out of trying to find poetic and even symbolic meaning behind, uh, kind of buried in what the, the presents are, instead of just trying to, instead of, I think a lot of people try to tie them to future events and uh, about Jesus' life and his death and, and get really fancy with it and really awkward with it sometimes. But I think the larger and more important point, I really do, I think the larger and more important point is to show that God caused pagan and Gentile wise men to travel thousands of miles to see and to celebrate the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's why they're there. As those who had the greatest opportunity and obligation dropped the ball. Right? As those who have ought to have known better and ought to have responded better went back to their homes unmoved or even made plans to, to try to off him. Prevent God from working as if he could actually pull that off. Even as God dropped the Christ child into the very middle of his obstinate and apathetic people, God preserved worship for him from among the last people in the story you expect to be bringing the worship. We need to pay incredibly careful attention to that reality while we're reading a gospel account that's specifically written to a Jewish audience. Right? I mean, spend, spend even half a second thinking about how that part of the story reads to people longing desperately for the Messiah to finally come. 
The ones who have the law and the ones who have the customs and the ones who live geographically close to the temple, the ones who are marked on their bodies with the sign of the covenant. Right? Those people, like how do they read this? Because Matthew's writing this to them and he points out to them that all the Jewish people got it wrong. And the guy that lived kind of close to the Jewish people and were kings of the Jewish people, they got it wrong. But all these guys over here from Babylon, they got it right. How does that read to them? Over and over and over again, Matthew's going to make it crystal clear that Jesus is everything, and I mean everything, that the promised Jewish Messiah and King was supposed to be. But also, over and over and over again, Matthew's going to make it crystal clear that Jesus is intentionally and joyfully folding Gentiles into his grand plan to establish his eternal kingdom. That he is creating a new people for himself of both Jews and Gentiles. But this people... They will not be set apart by who has access to the law or by who has the correct bloodline or the physical markings on their body. The entrance into this kingdom is not given to those who are located geographically close to the temple. No, it's given to those who respond in right worship to the king. So the very obvious next question. How do you respond to him? How do you respond? Respond to him. Listen, I do not care. And I really don't think Jesus does either. What your religious background is. I don't care what your bloodline is. Or even if you found your way here this morning through some weird unexplainable star thing. How do we respond to encountering the news that the king has come? What does that stir in you? What involuntary reaction does that create? Do you give your scholarly answer? Shrug your shoulders and then return back to your previous business? Do you work to maybe try to undermine God's claim to the throne by seeking to protect your false claim? Or do you fall down and worship? Bring whatever gifts are able to be given. I'm sure that the religious authorities hanging around Jerusalem all probably talked a big game about what they would do if the Messiah were to show up. I'm sure they ran through all kinds of thought experiments about how they would respond if they were only ever given the chance to respond. But when Jesus actually showed up, it revealed who they really were. It revealed who what they were actually chasing after. He tends to have that effect on folks. If you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Jesus yet, what, what, what you waiting for, man? What you waiting for? The Bible teaches that all people, by default, are separated relationally from God because of our sin, that we are owed the just and right punishment for that sin, death. But the Bible also teaches that God is rich in mercy and that he, he loves us with a great love, that even when we are dead in our trespasses and sins, God makes us alive through the grace of Christ. How does he do that? By sending his son. Jesus, he put on flesh and he dwelt among us. He lived the sinless life that none of us are able to live perfect righteousness before God. He died on the cross as an innocent substitute in our place to make payment for our sin. And he was raised again from the dead as a complete vindication of his own sufficient righteousness. And now as the king who conquered sin and death, he calls on you to respond to him in repentance and faith turn away from your sin and turn to him as Savior and Lord. And you can do that today, man. I'd love to be helpful to you. You can respond to Jesus. In a second, I'm going to pray and we're going to sing another song. That's, that's a time that we give people to kind of set aside so that they can translate kind of head stuff into action stuff. Do something with it instead of just thinking about it. Let's talk. But what about those of us who are already followers of Jesus? How, how can we respond? The same way we do every single week, by repenting of sin and by leaning into what God is revealing about himself in the text, right? And this week, I, th I think he's showing us that, that he will receive worship that is due to him. And he won't miss a beat. So we better be giving it or else he is well within his rights to go get it somewhere else. When his people failed, he raised up some guys in a faraway land to give him what he is owed. 
what does that worship actually look like this week? Like, it's one thing to, to be gathered here and, and sing some songs and listen to the Word and all of those things. What about when we leave here? What does that worship look like? We can't, we can't follow a star to a tiny home and lavish him with costly presents, so what do we do? Well, I think our opportunities to sing and to give and to serve ought to be in, invested in renewed devotion, but so, sh- so too should our opportunities to work and to play and to love and all the things that we do. Having a right religious answer is a completely different matter than having a rightly related heart. May we never be found having the former without the latter. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to respond in some other kind of way. Maybe that's by formally joining our church family, or maybe it's it's time to be obedient to Jesus' command to be baptized. You've never done that before. Or maybe it's time to finally say yes to his call on you to take the Gospels to somewhere far away from here. I don't know what that is, but we can talk about it. Sounds like a good day to me. But whoever you are, and however God's Word is calling you to respond, let's respond together right now. Father, you're good to us. Thank you for the Scriptures. And for the book of Matthew and for you getting the worship that you rightly do. God, I don't know if you built all this stuff up in Daniel's day, but you've been working and you've been working and you've been working and you've been working. Thank you for giving us the end of that story for showing us that even hundreds of years later, you fulfill your good promises. And God, may I never be like the the chief priests or the scribes, experts in the law and experts in worship that respond with none of what is right and appropriate. I thank you for loving us and for calling us to your kingdom. If there's anybody here today who doesn't know you yet, would you make yourself known to them? Would you call them to yourself right now? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.